I am talking to you, baby. I am right here. Sydney Steen. I want to welcome you here to Unity Spiritual Center of Portland. I was driving in today with my husband and we saw a billboard that had been posted by OHSU, which is Oregon Health Sciences University, and it said, today is a good day for a breakthrough. And I thought, wow, that is just absolutely perfect. So if you're listening, from wherever you are listening, I just want to invite you to use that as your mantra today. That is your affirmation. Today is a good day for a breakthrough. Today is a good day for a breakthrough, for understanding, for love, for peace, whatever it is that you are feeling is needed in your life or your heart is calling and saying, this is what I need to express. Today is a good day for that. So I am so glad that you have joined us. I'm just going to give you a little bit of information before we move into the service. We're doing things a little differently today. So you'll see me moving back and forth. I'm doing both music and message. And the amazing and powerful and fierce Amanda Kassab will also be doing our meditation. Excuse me, that's Amanda Kassab Johnson. And she is one of our practitioners here at Unity. And so we are just very, very glad that you're here. Let me just tell you what we're doing. Um, we have been making prayer flags to support Black Lives Matter. And last week, a number of people gathered on the sidewalk right there at our big parking lot on 47th and Stark and created beautiful prayer flags with everything from paints and beading and sequins to Sharpies and, I'd, and I don't know what else. But it's a wonderful experience. And so we'd like to invite you every Wednesday night, socially distanced, 
from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. And that, again, is the parking lot here for the church, which is at 47th and Stark. Uh, we need volunteers. We are sprucing up the center. We're not going to let this time of um, sheltering in grace or quarantine 2.0, as I like to call it, uh, we're not going to let it go by and not get stuff done. So we have been painting, we have been gardening, we've been doing all sorts of stuff. And if you would like to do some hands-on work with sanding and stuff like that outside, then please email our church e at admin at uh, unityofportland.org and uh, let Diana know. A volunteer meeting will be held tomorrow morning. That's Monday, August 10th at 10.30 a.m. to kind of figure out what needs to be done and who gets to do what. So if you'd like to join us, please do. Bring your mask and <laughs> come meet with us. I believe that that meeting will either be outside socially distanced or in the sanctuary socially distanced, but more will be revealed. <laughs> um, thank you for all of your support. We are very, very grateful that you are here with us. We are very, very grateful for all of your tithes and love offerings. And at any time during this service, you can text to this number, 77977, the word Unity of Portland, all one word, lowercase, and you will follow the prompts and you can tithe to this great community. Um, that's all I'm going to talk about right now. Um, as I get ready to move over, what I do want to tell you is one of our very beloved members of this community made her transition this morning at about 8 o'clock, Anjali Frazier, very beloved lo and just lovely human being. So we will release information as we know it if there is to be any sort of memorial celebration of her life. But would you please know that Everyone in this community who knew her, everyone in her family who is loving her and missing her, would you just know for her and all of us that this is a time for a breakthrough and that love is that which is guiding every movement, every shift, and that her life continues to be a blessing for all that she knew, for all of her family and for all of this community. So we bless Anjali Frazier as she moves into her greater life. So right now, I'm going to move over to the piano, and Amanda is going to lead us in a beautiful meditation. So let's just allow this music to lead us into a place of great joy, of great knowing, <sighs> of great comfort. May our beings know love and peace. May our children be safe and warm. May forgiveness flow through every heart and soul. And may we shine. beings no love and peace and may forgiveness flow through every heart and soul as we take this time to move in to a time of meditation we listen we become silent and we begin to hear that which is for us to hear. And as we move into this time of silence,
And as we return back to this moment, we come back knowing within our hearts, being filled with love and peace and allowing it to flow always. May our beings know love and peace. May our children be safe and warm. May forgiveness flow through every heart and soul. And may we shine through And may we shine through every storm. I've been thinking lately about the thing that keeps us going. What's the reason for believing even when the light's not showing? Is it more than hope or creative fire that binds us to our heart's desire? Earth and heaven bound together in one strand that winds forever. There's a thread connecting me and a thread connecting you to power never ending. It's always guiding and intending. It's the love connecting me. It's the love connecting you. We're gently woven by the hands of time. In a tapestry of infinite design, each of us eternal and divine in this thing called life. I know that spirit pulls and pushes through the pain and through confusion. It's saying, look beyond the things you know. Look beyond the world's illusions. Look beyond your hopes, beyond your wishes. Look beyond your superstitions. Earth and heaven are bound together in one strand that winds forever. There's a thread connecting me and a thread connecting you to power never ending. It's the always guiding and intending love connecting time in a tapestry of infinite design each of us eternal and divine in this thing called life
to power never ending it's always guiding and intending it's one life connecting me it's one life connecting you gently woven by the hands of time in a tapestry of infinite design each of us eternal and divine in this thing called life oh yeah in this thing called That is a song I wrote a few years ago as a project for a class, and it's titled The Double Thread. Now, it's based on a book by, gosh, one of my favorite authors in the world, Walter Starkey. He wrote a book called The Double Thread, and what he talked about in that was that we are both divine and human, that we have this human experience, but we are absolutely divine beings governed by divine laws, having a divine experience in what appears to be a human expression. Now, we're the ones who sign limits to that human expression. We are the ones who sign, uh, assign limits, who assign restrictions, who assign qualities to that, and tell ourselves a story of not being able to do this or do that, or being able to do this or that. But it is up to us, it's incumbent upon us to really, really look at the story that we are telling ourselves. Now, I was preparing this talk, and the title of my talk, by the way, is called All In, Fully Available to God. Now, I'm gonna ask you, if you get squidgy around the word God, would you just set that aside for now? And just know that God is referring not to a person, not to a place, not to a thing, but as a presence, an infinite loving presence that is source and substance for all life, meaning it is my source, it is the substance of my being. It is your source, it is the true substance of your being. Therefore, what is true about this presence that I happen to call God is true about me, is true about you. So let's just set that aside, and if you've got other, other baggage attached to that, we'll deal with that in a class sometime, okay? <laughs> because I need you to come into an awareness that this idea of God is never-ending, that everything you and I are is God. So I want to read um, a short verse from the Old Testament. Now this is from Malachi. Malachi was one of the, uh, the lesser prophets. I don't know what the greater prophets, I, I'm going to assume, let's call it Moses, because Moses gets a lot of press in the Bible. Malachi just gets a little bit of press in the Bible. But um, this is the verse. And those of you who, by the way, um, get Science of Mind magazine, like I do, you'll know that this is actually from today's reading. Do we not all have one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously against each against his brother so as to profane, to profane the covenant of our fathers? Okay, so let's break that down. Malachi actually translates into the word messenger. Messenger. And his gig was that he wanted to remind people of their covenant with Yahweh. Okay, so Yahweh, instead of going over here to father, um, or the old idea of God up on a cloud who's got anger issues and is keeping track of all the ways that we've screwed up. Yahweh actually, in this ancient Hebrew Aramaic sense, is a soft, wonderful idea of daddy, of source, of foundation, okay? So Malachi wanted to remind everybody that they actually came into this experience, this life, already having agreed to a covenant with Yahweh to be as that expression of Yahweh. So 
we need to remember this. We need to remember that covenant and know that we are already assured of this divine, infinite, powerful, glorious expression. Ernest Holmes wrote this, if our human relations are to mean the most to us, we must, must sense that there is hidden within, around, and through each of us a divine presence manifesting itself in infinite variations, the same impulse, the same love and life, but never quite alike in any two persons, right? Never quite alike. So our task is to remember that this presence is infusing, is embracing us, and is embracing all life. Even those people that you see who might even be in your own family or in your neighborhood or on the news where you just grit your teeth. They are all part of that same one presence and that one life. So, how's your covenant going? How is that going? You know, covenant is agreement. It means agree it means a commitment and it works both ways. So, if you have a covenant with someone, if you have an agreement, there is a responsibility on your part and a responsibility on their part. So let's think about this covenant with Yahweh, with God, with this presence, that we already have this agreement. We have this commitment, which means that it has its commitment to us. Goethe wrote this, at the moment of commitment, the universe conspires to assist you. Whoa, have you ever thought of it that way? You know, a lot of us tend to think that the universe might be against us, and we tend to walk around thinking that, that the universe is, is blocking us or it must be me. You know, life is just not working. And that is not so. I want you to know that that is not so and that we get to choose how we are going to experience this thing called life. So now, are you fully committed to living this life of possibility and infinite potential? Are you available now to high inspiration and exploration? Do you long for a greater meaning? You know, life needs you and spirit needs you. We are here to express, and we're all part, as I said in the song, of a tapestry, a greater idea. And if I am not showing up, then that thread is not playing its part, and that tapestry can unravel. So wouldn't it be nice to know that we are all honoring that commitment, that covenant to a great and rich life? The problem is, though, that we tend to embrace our fears, our superstitions, or we get our information from the world out there as opposed to that infinite in here. Plato said we can easily forgive a child who's afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. So, you and I have made this great covenant. We have made this great commitment, and it is dynamic it is powerful, and it is wondrous. <sighs> that may make you feel afraid of the light. That may make you wonder if you are up to the task of living out that agreement with spirit, living out that agreement with God, living out that agreement of miraculous, wondrous living. You know, we can have more good in our lives when we change the way that we think, when we change the thoughts we think. But, you know, we can live in great glory, great glory when we change our story. So we want to shift from pain to purpose. So, again, we want to shift from pain to purpose. Purpose comes from knowing that we have a great story. We have a great agreement. We have a great covenant. So what is the story you've been telling yourself or living in that's kept you from a victorious experience? What is that story? So now, it's interesting because in my own life, I find that I'll have a story and I am going to be real reticent to give it up because it makes me feel justified. It makes me feel right. Um, it is, as some of you will know, it is below the line when we talk about the 15 commitments of, of leadership, of conscious leadership, that if we are below the line, then we tend to do things like blame other people or think that we are a victim. So there's a, there's a, a sense of justification. And sometimes we just really, I want to, you know, 
darn what he did. I can't believe it. They're so wrong. They're so wrong. But what I'm recognizing is that I have to be willing to give up my justification and my drama. Oh, God, don't make me. But I have to in order to make room for peace of mind, for success, and by the way, sanity. Because justification and drama will absolutely cause your head to explode. It is a crazy place to be. So are you willing to give up that? Are you willing to interrogate your story with that intention of revealing solution, contribution, and evolution? Are you willing to embrace solution to whatever that issue is contribution, giving to life, giving to the people around you, giving to your own life, and evolution. Are you willing to grow? I know. I, I, wish, I wish it were a different way. I wish you didn't have to grow. I wish I didn't have to grow, but I didn't make up the rules. I'm not even an enforcer. I'm just, I'm, I'm here as, as, as a Malachi. I'm here as a messenger. We have to grow. If, if we can just deconstruct and question our stories then, you know what? Our stories can then be made to solve what seems to be unsolvable. Because each issue has the answer. Each issue, each question has an answer already within it. Our stories can contribute to our strength, our understanding, and our awareness, and they can also serve when we deconstruct, when we interrogate, and when we question, they can serve as an evolutionary stimulus for us to create guess what, new stories about our infinite connection, our divine potential, and the way that God is committed to us. The covenant on the other side that spirit has made to and through us for a glorious life. Now, one of my wonderful, wonderful mentors in spirit is a minister by the name of Lola Wright. And she talks about this a lot. In fact, she's the one who first hit me to this idea of the 15 commitments of conscious leadership because she lives it and speaks about it quite often. So I, I invite you to Google Lola Wright and check her out because she's pretty darn fierce. And she's, she challenges us, challenges me to notice the temptation to defend. Consider the frequency with which that temptation runs your response system. And then wonder, ah, what if there is nothing to defend? So, in our stories of somebody else's wrong, we are right, we are victims, and we are limited. It takes a lot of energy to defend that position. It takes a lot of power, it takes a lot of commitment, it takes a lot of strength to defend that thing. And what she's asking us to do is consider the frequency. Consider what it takes. Now, take a breath. What if there was nothing to defend? What if all of that energy that we put into defending our separateness that we put into our drama, our story of he did it to me, she did it to me, the world did it to me, politics, blah, 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 whatever that is. If we were willing to just suspend all of it, let it go, open ourselves up to an awareness of the highest truth that we are. What if we would just let that stuff go? Can you imagine the release of energy, of inspiration, and power that would come from that? You know, I like stories um, about, not, well, you know, good stories. I like the stories about people who have moved through their own limits, their own journey, and come into a greater story. So one of the persons I was um, thinking about this week was Bishop Carlton Pearson. Uh, Bishop Pearson is a black man who spent his life raised and preaching as part of the Baptist Pentecostal movement. Very, very powerful, very popular, and, and had churches where he would have 50,000, 50,000, fi that's 50,000 <laughs> followers who all embraced 
this idea of his Pentecostal faith and the way he expressed it, which is heaven and hell, heaven and hell, suffering, suffering, suffering. And there was a realization he had one day, and it struck him quite deeply that that was not the truth. That was not the truth. So he, he moved out of that. He stood in his mega church pulpit to proclaim a new doctrine, one that declared that because of Christ, and think of this, this Christ light that we all have within us, this Christ presence, not Jesus the person, but Christ the anointing of greater awareness, no, that because of that, no soul will spend eternity in hell. This controversial idea pretty much just blew everything. It, it blew everyone out of, the, uh, out, of the, out of the water. The doctrine polarized faith communities all over the world. He was rejected totally. He was not prepared for the rejection. He wasn't prepared for the stones that were aimed at him. He lost everything, his influence, his church, his friends, his finances. In a short period of time, one of the church's most beloved heroes went to zero, seemingly overnight. And he became the most prominently titled heretic of his generation. He kept going. And now what he has done is he is extremely busy with groups such as the Interfaith Alliance, which celebrates religious freedom by championing individual rights. The Human Rights Campaign, which champions the rights of LGBTQIA people to live in freedom, in protection, in safety, in full expression. He is part of the fellowship of affirming churches and ministers, uh, ministries. And he also is looking at this idea of a faith called metacostal, which is the metaphysics with passion. Metaphysics with passion. And his community is reaching thousands. And he emphasizes expanded consciousness Radically inclusive love and self-actualization. That's powerful. He looked at the story, and the story looked at him, and the story was no longer his story. That messenger within him, that Malachi part of him. And when we talk about the Bible, metaphysically, we know that each person in there, each each messenger is absolutely a part of ourselves. And so that Malachi part of him said, no, it's time, to, it's time to redo the covenant. Let's change the agreement, shall we? Let's look at this. So what is the thing that you need to change? You know, he looked at what was not working and stood in passion and power for an idea of what would work. And he was not fully, not fully knowing what that was going to be like. He did not fully know what it was going to be like. But do you know, here's the thing. It is possible for us to look at a situation and realize it's not working or the story is no longer serving us, to acknowledge it, and at the same time, bring that light of divine wisdom, a light of a higher idea, the possibility of a greater story, a greater covenant. We can bring it into that, no longer live at the level of frustration and problem limitation, and begin to present this thing that we think is blocking us to bring it into a place of higher awareness to where it absolutely transforms and blesses us. So it is possible to see what's not working and at the same time bring the light of divine wisdom to those problems. Solution absolutely is more powerful than problem. Now you may believe that seeing what's wrong in a situation and cultivating an awareness of what's possible could be challenging. You're right. It is. It requires discipline. But every great change maker or activist in the history of the world has worked from the level of the possible, not the level of permanent problematic. So do we want to work from the level of the possible or do we want to work from this level of, God, that really sucks. 
because this level is not going to help. It's not going to transform you or the world. It's not going to heal anybody. You will feel justified. And if that's what you want, uh, you, you know the question I'm going to ask you. How's that working for you? The great advances in our world. Healing polio, yellow fever, all of that. Landing on the moon all came about by working with, not against, with that thing, quote unquote, most feared, to find the answer within that. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. declared, I have a dream, but he only became available to that dream by acknowledging the nightmare. And it was a nightmare, and it still is for so many people. And in many ways, look at where we are. We feel challenged, inundated by so much that's going on. And the first response is to hide from it, is to retreat into that which is safe and predictable. The, the old story of, well, it, it, if only, the if only stories. But what about moving beyond that and saying, okay, I acknowledge it. And there has to be greater truth. There has to be greater solution. There has to be more. What is the new covenant? What is my Malachi self? What does that messenger want me to know? You know, the solution to escaping the Earth's gravity in order to explore space and land on the moon happened because scientists, it's not because they, they ignored or denied gravity. They worked with the principle. And it became their tool. So consider how evolution works, right? Nothing is a spontaneous appearance. Nothing is magic. All of the things that you and I have, like opposable thumbs, little toes, hair, eyes in the front, not the sides of our heads, you know, <laughs> because that's, that's an adaptation over here for what might attack, but eyes in the front so we can see what's before us and above us. All of these things have occurred because of the biological need to embrace a problem and adapt to it by accepting a need for change. So is it possible that our struggles and our fears and those stories of limitation are actually invitations and signals that there's growth, that we're here to adapt, and now it's time to explore our greater potentials? Is that possible? Instead of looking at these things as problems, the story of problem, of limitation, of issue, <sighs> look, my invitation is here. Look what just came in the mail, my invitation to grow. Look what just came within my soul, my invitation to prosper, to expand, to be loved, to have all of that. Look what just came, and it got my attention because it just really feels bad, which is unfortunately, how we most often respond to something because it hurts. I know that we also have the ability to evolve beyond that and listen at an earlier time before the message gets louder and louder and louder and suddenly we have that two by four upside the head that tells us, wake up! I know that we have the ability to listen sooner, but sometimes we want to wait, clinging to our story and our justification before we will actually say, fine, I'll listen. Let me open up that message that just came in my spiritual email. There are some tricks to being able to move into a greater awareness, particularly when we are distressed, we are anchored in anxiety, when we are connected to fear and frustration and problem. So get your pencils. First one, and it's real easy. We just recognize the limitless presence of God in, as, and around you, me, all life, even those people you don't like. All the power in the universe is available to you and active as you in this present moment, this present moment. So are you using it? Are you using it to consciously think about what you want to see and experience in the world. You have it all right here and right now. Then the next thing, so we are recognizing the infinite presence. Choose to be willing 
to see whatever it is differently. You don't even have to know what that is. You don't even know, have to know what that differently might look like. There's a, a, an idea in the course of miracles, and it's a prayer of just, Lord, I am willing to see this differently. God, I'm willing to see this differently. Spirit, I'm willing to see this differently. And I know that every time I have invoked those words, whatever it is that has uh, tied me down, frustrated me, caused me pain, deep pain, has begun to dissolve because I have, I've opened myself up to a new way of approaching it, a new idea, a new way of looking at it, a new story. Choose to be willing to see it differently. So first we recognize the limitless presence of God. Then we choose to be willing. And you know how we do this here sometimes. We have to be willing to be willing to be willing to consider, to be willing to maybe to be willing to think about, to be willing, however far away you have to get from that, go for it. Because spirit just needs one little tiny opening in order to plant that light of transformation. Then the next thing is to begin to move into a consciousness of it is done. And you may not know what the done looks like, but we can move into a place of light. We can move into the knowing that it is there, it is done. I am open, I am fully, ah, fully ready right here and right now. I was looking at quotes about fear and about resistance, and I found one from someone named Usman B. Asif, and he said, fear is a dark room where negatives develop. <laughs> it's a dark room where negatives develop. So come into the light, please. Come into the light. Don't let those negatives develop. Allow life to take place. You know, the only thing that grows in the dark are, are mushrooms. You are not a mushroom. So let's move into that place where the light can feed you, where the truth can feed you, where inspiration can lift you up, where there's possibility and, and there can be, mm, there can be a, a, a new way of, of viewing and, and living and it can sustain you. Helen Keller said that the only thing worse than being blind is having sight but no vision. Are we willing to have the vision? And are we willing to give it sway in our lives over the sight? Because we can look around and we can see what appears to be there. But if we do not allow for a vision of possibility, of truth, of power, of presence, then we have sight but no vision. Is it possible that those things which we would rather deny, criticize, or run from are here to inspire, bless, strengthen, and even enrich us? Is it possible? And can we move into that place of be being willing to execute that vision? Thomas Edison wrote that vision without execution is hallucination. So then we become that place where we can live as that new idea, as that new story, as the, those ideas, and I promise they do come through, as they begin to come into your awareness, because now you've lifted yourself up into the awareness of God, and that's all you got to do, just move into an awareness of God. Begin to look around, that's God, that's God, that's God, that's God. In that place is where we begin to become receptive to possibility. That's where thought changes. That's where life changes. That's where we become aware of our oneness and the oneness of all humanity. We want to move into that idea of humanity, of possibility, of glory, of joy, not limitation, not frustration. You know, Oprah Winfrey said, create the highest, grandest vision possible for your life because you become what you believe. Now, we know that. We absolutely know that. We become what we believe. So perhaps this week, the challenge is to begin to truly, truly, lovingly look at what we have all become. What have you become? Have you become tight and fearful? Are you willing to become open? Are you willing to become that expression of the possible? Are you willing Gene Houston called it the possible human. Are you willing to be that? 
So here's, again, what we need to do. In those times, you return to a mindful state of recognizing God, recognizing the omnipresence. Consciously choose possibility. Consciously choose possibility. Whew, and be willing to live as that possibility. I bless you all. I know that everything that we do in this life has, hmm, has a divine imprint. And all of it is good. So I want to close just with some information. Um, my position as assistant minister here has been eliminated. My position as spiritual uh, coordinator of our, our prayer ministry has been eliminated. And my position as music director has been eliminated. I am so grateful that I have been able to serve this community, that I have been able to love and be loved by this community. And I am excited about what the future may bring. And I am here to serve in whatever way I can. And I know that as I begin to live a new story, and this community lives a new story, that we are all blessed. And I know this for each of us. So I'm just going to take a moment to pray. And I invite you to just take a moment yourself to breathe in. And let's just take these words in. <sighs> I recognize that infinite power and presence of God is all there is. It surrounds and fills each of us with itself. And it is that infinite potential, that infinite activity that is always, always receptive and moving to support all life. So in this, we choose life. We choose possibility. And we choose right now to be filled with a new story about who we are, where we're going, why we're here. We allow that message to come forth in full power, in full celebration, in glory, and without any restriction. We allow hope to be a part of this, and we choose to know that faith guides everything that we do, for we are beings of true light. We are the joy of God. We are the love of God. We are the celebration of spirit. So I know that each of us is fully blessed by this, and I know that we are a blessing in the world. We bless this community. We bless all people everywhere, all churches, all, all synagogues, all mosques, all ashrams, all temples. We know that each, each offers a path to unfoldment, to understanding, to being very, very, very lovingly connected to each other and to God. So with a full and grateful heart, I release this word into spiritual law, knowing it is so. And as you are at home, I invite you to say with me, and so it is. I invite you to support this community. Again, if you would be willing to offer your love offerings, your tithes, 77977 is the number. And you just put in the, me in the message field the words, Unity of Portland. I'm being handed a message Okay, thank you. I'm so, and that's really, really, we are grateful for all that you do, and we are grateful with the consciousness that you do it with. If you would like to receive our, our newsletter, you can certainly do that. You can sign up um, through the contact page on our website, and that's unityofportland.org. And by the way, Coffee and Connection is going to begin five minutes after this service. And that is, there's a Zoom link that's in the feed. It's also in our newsletter, and it's on our Facebook page. And so you can certainly connect to that and connect with other people and be able to see those people that you haven't seen in a while. Um, and I have one more thing I want to tell you about. So we honor the life of Anjali Frazier, and we also honor the life of John Sterry. So John and Beverly Sterry have been a part of this community for many years. And John, too, made his transition this weekend. This beautiful, beautiful, loving, very funny man that we have come to embrace and to enjoy. And he shared his, his process with him, with us, as he was on this journey of, of what the world calls Alzheimer's. And yet he 
His heart remained. And so we surround Beverly, we surround the entire family with love, and we are grateful to have experienced the joy of John Sterry in our beautiful church family, our community. And we know that as he moves into his greater life, all of us are blessed. So I'm just going to offer you ah, another song. I'm moving over here now. What is the story you want to tell? I am called to be a healer for all humanity. I am called to be a dreamer, believe in what can be. I am called to be a maker, be an instrument of peace. I am called to be a giver of abundance I receive. I am called to be a prayer, living out the truth I seek. I am called to be everything I'm called to be. I'm called to be the glory here on earth so all might see all the love and all the beauty that shines in you and me. We are the living, breathing God, and you are one in me. We are called, we're called to be. You are called to be a mother, to nurture family. You are called to be a brother, be strength in times of need. You are called to be a neighbor, see a friend in all you meet. You are called to be a leader, to build community. You are called to be a prayer, living out the truth you seek. You are called to be everything that you're called to be. Called to be the glory here on earth so all might see all the love and all the beauty that shines in you and me. We are the living, breathing God, and you and I are one in me. We are called to be. Called to be peace, called to be joy, called to be love, called to be peace, called to be joy. We're called to be love. We're called to be. Beloved beings, blessed beings, I am so grateful. And I bless this day for you. I bless it for all of us. And I know that we truly, truly are called to be greater and called to be love, called to be joy, called to be peace. And I celebrate you in that. Thank you very much. And so it is. Amen.